Welcome to a very special budget event here. It's a Battle of the Think Tanks event today here, hosted by the CIS. And I'm joined by three of Australia's think tank luminaries. Danielle Wood is the Chief Executive at the Grattan Institute. She's published extensively on economic reform priorities, budget policy, tax reform, generational inequality and political institutions. Stephen Kirshner is the Program Director of Trade and Investment at the United States Study Centre at the University of Sydney here in Sydney and a former CIS colleague of mine. And Emma Dawson, last but not least, is the Executive Director of Per Capita. She's a former senior advisor on digital inclusion at Telstra, um, an executive director of the Institute for a Broadbrand Enabled Society and a senior policy advisor in the Rudd and Gillard governments. Ladies and gentlemen and fellow panellists, thank you for joining us today. Stay here, Simon. Thanks for the invite. We're talking about one of the most influential, potentially one of the most important, one of the most significant budgets, at least for the last decade. We are facing now a $214 billion budget deficit, raising about half a trillion dollars of deficits across the forward estimates, and more than a trillion dollars of debt is now barreling down at us here in Australia. And from my perspective, before I throw open to the panelists and their views on this, just wanted to give you a sense of my take here. I think this is a missed opportunity for the government. What they have done, and it is to their credit, they're focused primarily on short-term initiatives that won't have a long-term impact on the budget, but they have missed an opportunity to entrench the kind of reform agenda that Frydenberg has been talking about for months now. He's talked about Hawke, he's talked about Keating, he's talked about Thatcher, but what we have instead is a short-term temporary stimulus budget aimed at pushing money out the door in the next few years, a hundred odd billion dollars in welfare payments, a hundred billion dollars worth of business incentives, um, so bringing forward some of the tax cuts, but the kind of longer term thinking, the kind of longer term reforms that may have seen the government leave its stamp on the budget here have sadly been lacking. And what we've seen instead, I think, is a government that is trying to reap political benefits from short-term spending rather than lay out a long-term economic agenda. However, the panellists may have a different view. Danielle, what's your take on what has been an extraordinary budget? Uh, thanks, Simon. Um, and I look, I absolutely agree with the point that this uh, is the most important budget in quite some time. Um, look, I, I disagree with the fundamental point you just made that the priority should have been on supply side reforms in this budget. We're off to a good start then, a bit of disagreement right up the front. The priority now, given the point we are at the economic cycle, is absolutely stimulus and fixing the plan. Uh, we, we probably agree about a lot of the supply side reforms that should happen, but you know, this is not the right moment in time for that. The priority had to be on stimulating demand. Um, look, I think it's a big budget. Um, it's one that I, I would characterise as a high risk economic strategy. And I, I, I characterise it that way because essentially I think the government is really backing in strongly that idea of the private sector recovery. Uh, most of the big measures are ones which go to business cash flow, trying to create an incentive for business investment and hiring. Um, I don't mind those measures. I, I don't have anything against them per se. And I think they are reasonably well designed for the purpose. Uh, but my concern is that the major break on investment, um, both in this crisis and even before the crisis, has been weak consumer demand. And it's not clear to me where that's going to come from. Um, the budget is forecasting basically zero real wages growth for the next four years. That's going to mean it will be about a decade before <laughs> any of us have enjoyed a pay rise. Uh, you know, that's hardly the conditions for a consumer-led boom. Uh, tax cuts will help a bit this financial year. Um, you know, I think we will see some boost to consumer spending. Um, just before this webinar, I started to look in more detail at what was being proposed there and what I thought was happening, which was the offset being brought forward this year, isn't actually going to be brought forward until July next year. So uh, it may not actually have the immediate stimulus effect that um, I initially thought it would have. Um, so my concern is really that they're putting the investment cart before the consumption horse and we're going to miss um, a crucial opportunity for recovery in the near term. 
Uh, it is very much a one-year plan, as you point out, Simon. Um, you know, this is absolutely all temporary measures. Um, there's virtually zero economics policy support there by the time you get to 2022, 23. Um, in one sense, that's good. It gives the government some flexibility to react as, as we see what the economic circumstances are. But I do think they have made a mistake, actually, in so studiously avoiding doing anything permanent. Um, so I think some of the permanent things that we really did need to happen, like the increase in job seeker, um, like more investment in services like aged care and childcare, um, really would have been better announced now at this point in time. Um, so, look, I'll, I'll wind up there. So I'll just say in summary, you know, we've backed in the private sector recovery. I would have liked to see a much more diversified approach, one that was more tailored to this, the nature of this particular recession. Um, and my hope is really that we keep an open mind and we're willing to shift course if the gamble's not paying off. Uh, thanks very much for that, Danielle. Emma, you and I were sparring over the budget uh, 22 hours ago. It seems like a lot longer than that to me. It may well do to you. What's your impression of what's actually been announced? Um, well, there's not much that Danielle said there that I would disagree with. I think the, the important, um, the, the biggest problem with what they've announced in terms of um, asset write-offs and, and business stimulus is it's coming, as Danielle said, at the wrong time. Um, then there's nothing actually for business investment down the track when business is likely to have recovered. So expecting business to invest in an environment where there's no consumer demand, I think is pretty um, uh, optimistic. Uh, and I think the fact that those measures are only built in for one year, uh, they're probably going to be needed after 12 months if we can get uh, consumer spending up in that period. There's nothing really that directly targets that consumer spending. The tax cuts, um, whilst, while, while I don't object to bringing forward stage two, I actually suggested that that need, was needed even before the last election. I think um, they should have been coupled with more direct provision of, of income support for those at the very lower end, including an extension of job seeker, a permanent increase to that, um, and investment in more shovel-ready infrastructure projects like social housing um, and investment as I was, you and I were sparring about yesterday, Simon, um, in the care economy, uh, lifting uh, childcare places, making childcare more affordable. We know that will get women back to work. Danielle's recent report um, showed that you know a five, uh, you know, increasing the rebate to ninety five percent would would bring a return of eleven billion dollars a year just through women's workforce participation. Um, similarly, um, some of the aged care measures that are needed, I think this is a missed opportunity to invest in those up front. Um, but if effectively, I don't see it. I, I do see a lot of faith in a private sector led recovery. And I'm not sure that that faith is well placed at this point in time. As I said, I think uh, support for business should come down the track when we've already got the economy up off the mat. And there needed to be a lot more direct demand side um, spending in this budget to do that. The missed opportunity for me is that it's a budget with very little long-term vision for the country. Um, it really just seeks to uh, shore up the immediate crisis, as, which is what the spending so far has already done um, through wage subsidies and so on, but not to shift the fundamental basis on which we operate our economy. And as um, we know, most of us admit that the, we were not well-placed going into this economy. Wage growth was very sluggish, underemployment was stubbornly high, unemployment was higher than most comparable developed nations coming out of the, the GFC. Um, we've actually gone fallen backwards below a lot of comparable countries in those years. Um, business investment was was very limited. Um, and so just kind of saying, okay, well, well, we'll try and get business back on track and hope that we can we can get back within a year for a prediction of 4.75% growth over the next 12 months. Um, I think these things are pretty optimistic. And what I see as the missed opportunity is, an op is, a, is the chance to really say, okay, this is a massive crisis. We have had to take on such an enormous amount of debt. Why don't we use it to genuinely make the country better? And that would have seen a government um, shifting the way that we uh, tax wealth, shifting the way that we um, distribute, redistribute income through society. I think um, investing a lot more in communities and community-led recovery rather than top-down business-led recovery um, and a lot uh, more investment in the care economy and a caring society. So um, there wasn't a lot in the budget I was thrilled with and I'd like to make particular mention um, 
of the fact that, you know, what many people are calling a pink collar recession, where women have been at the forefront of losing jobs and losing hours of work, and other women have been on the front line of the pandemic, providing essential care work and essential services. Uh, there was $240 million over five years for the Women's Economic Security Statement. That's less than a third of 1% of the budget deficit. So this is not a budget that delivers for women. Thank you, Emma. Um, I'm going to see if we can make it a quartet of people unhappy with the budget, or perhaps, Stephen, you've got a more positive view. Uh, I do have a somewhat more positive view. So I think the budget was reasonably well framed and crafted to address some of the immediate problems that the government is facing and is most focused on. So I think the tax measures, the uh, depreciation measures, um, and the labour market support measures uh, were all appropriate. We can sort of quibble about the design of those, uh, the magnitude and the timing, uh, but I think they're all good measures designed to address uh, immediate problems. Um, uh, the main thing that I objected to in the budget was the manufacturing strategy, and we can come back to that uh, later if you want to, but I think it's uh, a misdirected approach to solving uh, the wrong problem. Um, so, in terms of a, a sort of broader reform agenda that you alluded to earlier, Simon, uh, I mean, this is a fiscal policy statement. I don't think it's the right time to uh, announce or even implement a major reform agenda. Uh, and I don't think the budget actually precludes the government from doing that down the track. Uh, I think if you look at the, the temporary nature of a lot of what the government is doing, uh, I think they're clearly trying to set themselves up to embark on a reform agenda uh, probably uh, after the next election with maybe hints of that uh, in the, in the run-up to the election. Uh, so I'm not going to give the government a hard time uh, on some of those deeper structural reform issues at the moment. Uh, there will be plenty of time to do that later. Uh, I think the government had much more pressing concerns that it was trying to uh, address. Um, and in terms of the uh, effect of the budget in, in stimulating activity and demand, I, I mean, I think it will come up short in that regard, um, but not so much because of the budget measures. I think the problem we have here is that the effectiveness of fiscal policy in stimulating demand uh, really comes down to whether we have accommodation for monetary policy. Uh, and I don't think the Reserve Bank is doing enough to support demand in the economy at the present time. Uh, I think there's more that they can and should do. I think it explains why the economy was weak going into the pandemic. Uh, we had uh, below target inflation, we had unemployment above its uh, full employment rate. Um, so our starting point was uh, not strong. Uh, and I don't think the uh, Reserve Bank has done enough to address uh, the shortfall in demand that's uh, resulted from the pandemic. Uh, so I'd like to see a lot more support from uh, monetary policy, we know that fiscal policy multiplies much larger when you have monetary accommodation. Uh, we don't have enough of that at the moment. And I think that's going to uh, crimp the effect that the budget has on uh, demand. I think we can just stay with that issue of stimulus here as sort of an initial framing point, Stephen, and I, and I want to just uh, explore that a little bit further. I mean, the, the government, the Treasurer was out talking yesterday about the need for fiscal stimulus, how important it is, and, and I think trying to draw a distinction between the Rudd government stimulus, which the Coalition very aggressively attacked, um, and the necessary actions that the government has undertaken here. Um, I think you're correct in pointing out that monetary policy has done relatively little. That's a criticism that we as an organisation have also made. Uh, but has the government done enough to make its case for fiscal stimulus here? And do you think they've done enough to distinguish this from what happened with the Rudd era stimulus that they were so aggressive in attacking? I think people forget that the coalition back during the GFC never actually rejected the principle of fiscal stimulus. So if you go back to what Joe Hockey was saying at the time, his main objection was really to the size of what the Labor government was doing. It wasn't a outright rejection of the, the principle of fiscal stimulus. Um, but I also think there's a very important distinction between what was done during the GFC and, and what we're doing now. And it's very hard to stimulate an economy that's been deliberately shut down by government fear in order to contain the pandemic. Uh, 
I, I give the measures that the government face more of a supply, which is to say what I do is to preserve the fabric of uh, contractual relationships between employers and employees, uh, between buyers and sellers, really trying to keep the supply side of the economy intact so that when the pandemic is passed, uh, we're left with an economy that's uh, in, in better shape than it would be otherwise. So I don't see it in terms of stimulating demand. I see it as preserving the supply side of the economy. The other dimension to that, of course, is just providing uh, relief to people who are experiencing hardship. Uh, I think you can make the case for doing that, which really doesn't hinge on what the, the broader macroeconomic effect is. Uh, I think there's a compelling case for uh, helping uh, people who are adversely affected by uh, the, the downturn that doesn't depend uh, upon whether or not there's a, a aggregate effect uh, on the economy. Thanks, Stephen. Danielle, one of the things that I think is notable about this supposedly fiscal stimulus focused budget is that once you move past JobKeeper and JobSeeker, both of which have been with us already for six months, a lot of the focus of the new spending is really on trying to stimulate business investment, trying to stimulate um, productivity gains in the near future rather than immediately. Has the government really done enough that, that could genuinely be called fiscal stimulus here? Uh, so I think the answer is no, and probably the best evidence for that is in the unemployment forecasts. Um, they're still forecasting, you know, seven and a quarter percent unemployment by June next year, six and a half percent by the middle of 2022. Um, you know, quite frankly, that's too high for too long. Um, as you say, most of the measures or a lot of the key measures are around business investment. And as I said, you know, I think it's part of the puzzle, but um, more traditional stimulus is obviously trying to um, boost aggregate demand and, and consumption. Um, so I think there, you know, there is still a sort of danger in that period when um, JobKeeper is going to come off in March next year. Um, my concern is, you know, the budget is based on an assumption that the health situation is under control, um, that things open up again, um, that we have a vaccine and essentially we can open our borders and operate as normal. Um, you know, that's one state of the world, but there, there's certainly many other states of the world. But, you know, let's assume that is the world for now. Um, then, you know, we really do need to be looking at how we boost aggregate demand. Um, so I would have liked to see more. Um, you know, I've written about some of the overseas schemes and some of the things state governments are doing in terms of vouchers to actually get um, consumers out and spending. And you can target those sectors that have been very hard hit. Uh, in this case, you know, hospitality, tourism, the arts, um, there was nothing really for those sectors in this budget. Um, the wage subsidy, I think, is quite a good way to move from a kind of broad-based scheme like JobKeeper, which you don't want to keep in place forever because it does um, stifle structural adjustment. Um, so that idea of switching to a subsidy for new hires is a good one. Um, targeting young people, I think there is a case for that, given we know they're going to be disproportionately hit. Uh, but again, it comes down to the scale and I'm just not sure that's going to be sufficient um, to create the jobs boost that we need. Uh, Emma, just to you on that, I mean, you, you've sort of expressed a number of different policies around investing in the care economy, increasing new start, those sort of payments. Uh, how feasible do you think it is politically for that to be the centrepiece of a coalition government budget? Um, Look, ideologically, it's a stretch for them, perhaps, but I think there's strong uh, economic evidence for uh, for the, the measures that I and others have proposed in this space. Um, you know, how, how feasible was it for a, a coalition government to, to go into so much debt um, and to take such a fiscal investment in the first place? People would have said, not very. Um, and yet they've done the only possible practical thing. I'm not surprised at all um, that they have spent the way they've had to to, to protect the economy. Um, but the ideological shift that's needed really um, to do some of the things that I'd like to see changed is probably a stretch too far. But I do think the point that, that Danielle has made here is a really critical one. Yes, we have to see the private sector recover. There is no recovery without business getting up off the mat and employing people and driving economic growth hand in hand with the government. But 
um, the, the sectors that have been really hard hit by this recession, differently to previous, previous recessions, are services and, and customer-facing jobs. So retail, hospitality, um, entertainment, events. These are not um, businesses, and many of them are small and medium enterprises, right, and they employ people in their local communities. They're not going to be taking advantage of a lot of investment and asset write-offs right now. They need their customers back first. And the, the um, the policy that Danielle's advocated for and that I, I agree with very strongly is that kind of targeted voucher system. I noticed the, the Mayor, Sally Cap, who's standing for re-election here in Melbourne, has announced a thing called Melbourne Dollars, where the, the City of Melbourne will provide 20% discount to you can buy, you know, 500 bucks for $400 and spend it in a local restaurant. That's much more the kind of targeted response that we need to see to get the sectors that have actually been most affected by this recession operating again. What the government doing I think is is saying okay this isn't something we're used to doing but the, the coalition government has actually never been in power to, to at a time of recovery from a recession that in certainly since the Second World War so they've looked at the old rule book and gone well you invest in infrastructure and you give business incentives and that may have been the appropriate uh, measure for coming out of the 90, early 1980s recession or the early 1990s recession, but this one is quite different because it's been caused effectively by a deliberate shutdown of customer-facing industries, and those measures are not going to get those customer customers back to those businesses anytime soon. So even you know, if we weren't going to get the kind of big ideological shift that I as a social democrat would like to see in an investment in care and an investment in women's jobs and a lifting of the, a permanent lifting of the unemployment benefit, all of those things are economically valid as well. But we could have seen a much more targeted fiscal response even within the government's own ideology, I think, and they, they haven't done that. Uh, just as Anthony Carr has pointed out in the comments, and, and I'll throw this one to you as well, Danielle, because I think this is relevant. Uh, he asks the question, is it logical to shut down an economy and stimulate the economy at the same time? We're talking about sectors, retail, tourism, uh, you know, is there any realistic chance that, that those industries are going to recover to anything like their previous level, given where we are with the virus now and where we reasonably expect to be for the next 12 months? I mean, is there a case to say that what we really need to do is facilitate some structural change because that structural change will happen no matter what? Um, so I, th I think it's kind of conflating two points. So I think there was a period in time when things were, were shut down and Stephen's already alluded to this, where you're definitely not talking about stimulus. You were talking about support, which was, you know, helping the bridge we heard a lot about, you know, businesses get to the other side so we didn't take a hit to the productive capacity of the economy. That was the doubling of job seeker. That was job keeper, you know, was fundamental to that period. Um, we are now in a world where things are starting to open. I'm in Melbourne, so probably the least <laughs> open of any parts in Australia, but my understanding is some people have much more normal life in, in other parts of Australia, and we certainly hope that we'll be there soon too as well. Um, so premised on the idea that we can get the virus under control, then we are in that world where we're talking about stimulus and helping boost demand in those sectors. Um, if we get another flare-up of the virus, agree back in a totally different world and we're having a totally different economic conversation. Um, but the other part of your question really, Simon, is you know, are there parts of the economy that, you know, even in that post-virus world just aren't going to come back. Um, you know, retail might be one example. You know, have we fundamentally shifted to online purchases so that, you know, we're just not going to have as many CBD retailers as we once did? Um, and I, I think that probably is the case. You know, this will lead to some fundamental shifts in behaviour, which means there are some businesses that are not going to survive. Um, and what we've, what the government's needed to do is kind of calibrate the settings so that, far as possible predicting productive capacity, but you can't keep those supports in place forever because that structural adjustment will need to happen. Uh, and I think the way they've done that is quite good. It's extending JobKeeper, transitioning it down, retesting eligibility, um, all of that makes sense. And if you look at all the new measures, they're all focused on going forward what you know hopefully will be the set of businesses that are sustainable in the longer term. I suppose that leads us really naturally to the issue of the assumptions that underlie particularly around the coronavirus assumptions in the budget and and to be frank here a lot of them seem to be either quite optimistic or simply just you know wild ass guesses what do we think is going to happen with the virus in the near future. 
Um, obviously, there's a huge impact here. The government assumes that all the borders other than WA will be open by the end of this year. They assume that all future outbreaks will be local and contained through contract tracing. They assume that there will be a virus widely distributed to the country in the second half of next year. They implicitly assume, if not explicitly assume, that similar things will occur in our major trading partners. Uh, how realistic are they, Steve and Emma? How realistic are those assumptions and what happens what happens to the economy and the budget if they don't come to pass? Well, I think this goes to the point that we are hostage to the course of the virus and we're not alone in this. I think this is true for the world economy as well. Uh, I think what's happened in Victoria demonstrates that in many ways the rest of the country is sitting on a knife edge. It would be very easy for the virus to run away on us. Uh, and so one of the things I would have like to have seen in the budget actually was a greater focus on maintaining uh, support for the public health measures that were put in place earlier during the pandemic. Uh, I think we need to resource things like uh, contact tracing and testing. Uh, I think we need to do things like scale up managed isolation and quarantine capacity. Uh, so you know, we need to keep a, a focus on containing the virus. But the other problem we have, of course, is that even if we are successful in suppressing or even eliminating the virus in Australia, it's still going to be rampant internationally. And this has implications for our ability to reopen our borders. So as long as the virus is prevalent internationally, this is really going to limit key external sectors of the economy. And so what I would like to see is much greater attention to how we can safely uh, reopen the borders uh, recognising that you know, international travel is going to be expensive, um, managing uh, border controls is going to be expensive. Uh, I think these are areas that probably need greater uh, resourcing uh, because we, as a small open economy, we need to be engaged with the rest of the world and that means having cross-border people flows. Uh, at the moment, if you look at the, the, the net migration numbers that the government has put forward, uh, they seem to be assuming that those cross-border uh, flows are going to be pretty limited for the next few years. Uh, and so I think this is, this is a problem in, in many ways. Um, by successfully containing the virus here, we actually make it even more costly to reopen the border because in doing that, we put at risk some of those gains. Emma, the trade-offs uh, between you know the economic conditions and the the health concerns have been a fairly significant impact to the debate leading up to um, and coming out of the lockdown in Melbourne. There isn't really a lot in the budget, and certainly not in the treasurer's speech about any of those trade-offs. Do do you think that's something that they've missed out on, or is this simply a case of the figures need to assume that this is going to be under control? Um. I think they, in order to project an optimistic um, fiscal outlook, they have assumed that the that the virus is going to be under control. I think a lot more. Uh, I think a lot more optimistically than than is realistic, to be frank. Um, so the idea that we'll have a fully effective vaccine, and uh, you know that that vaccine will have been provided to sufficient numbers numbers of people to create um, herd immunity within the next twelve months, I think is a is a stretch. Um, it's a coronavirus, which is more like the common cold than the flu, and we've never actually successfully developed a vaccine for a coronavirus, um, and we're trying to do this very very quickly. So I think that's the first big assumption. And I'm I'm no epidemiologist, but all of the experts will tell you we should not be counting our chickens on a vaccine anytime soon. I think Stephen's point about the borders and the, the fact that um, international movements of people is likely to be restricted for some time is, is a really big issue and it doesn't match the predictions for growth um, in the economy because if you think about other than um, minerals and resources exports, two of our biggest um, industries are education and tourism. Now those are not going to come back anytime soon as long as our borders are closed and those are industries that we're going to see we're already seeing massive job losses in the tertiary sector there's been no support really for that sector in fact quite the opposite 
Um, and there's nothing really in this budget that targets effectively targets supporting those tourism businesses that are affected as well. Again, they're employers of women, um, dominantly, predominantly employers of women. So um, one of the other areas that is affected by this, of course, and, and I'm getting back on my, my hobby horse here, but is the care sector. Um, actually, a third of workers in the care sector and half of workers in the aged care sector now are overseas born. They're migrants and a lot of them come in on temporary working visas. So we're going to need to replace those workers over the next uh, two to four years as well. Um, well, the government did announce an, an additional 23,000 home care packages. It, it, it seems to me at least moderately reasonable that they'd wait for the findings of the Royal Commission uh, before they announced a more substantive package in the aged care sector. Uh, do you think that this is just not enough? Um, 23,000 is about a quarter of what's needed to close the waiting list for home care. And uh, there's no, it, it's very welcome, don't get me wrong, it's very welcome. It's actually the number one thing that we need to focus on and the Royal Commission made that clear in its interim report in aged care was home care packages. Um, I'm, I'm waiting to see the detail of whether those 23,000 are state, uh, level one packages or level four, which is the, level four is the package that's really hard to get and that is the one that keeps people out of residential aged care. Um, but it comes back again that if we're going to if we're going to provide another 23,000 home care packages we're going to need the workforce to provide them um, and uh, that's going to need that's going to take time to find within the domestic economy absent that Im that immigration uh, workforce and uh, it's going to take extra investment and extra resources to skill them up and ensure that they're provided with what they needed so no that is a welcome development and I I do think that, yes, it's reasonable to say, look, we'll wait to see the full report of the Royal Commission, but there's been an interim report, there's been a COVID report. Um, the sector's in desperate, desperate trouble. So I, don't, I think sooner rather than later is my answer on care. But, but the, the broader issue I was making really is we are exposed. Those industries, tourism, education, even care, are exposed to the restrictions now that will come on immigration and on the movement of people. Um, and I do think that some of the government's predictions about how soon we'll be able able to safely open up to the rest of the world are perhaps a little optimistic. Thanks for that. I, I want to move now to one of the, certainly the, the main focuses leading up to the budget was the prospect of tax cuts. I think there was um, some expectation or at least fear, depending on your uh, perspective on this, that the government would move forward all of its currently legislated tax packages. What they have done instead is move forward stage two to commence at the start of this financial year that's um, tweaking some of the uh, thresholds that tax rates apply at so there's an increase in the, the maximum threshold the minimum threshold for the 19 percent level there's an increase in the maximum threshold for the 20 32.5 percent threshold what hasn't been fast-tracked is the significant flattening of the tax rates that was scheduled to apply and is still theoretically scheduled to apply from 2024 um, Danielle, should the government have looked at moving its whole tax package forward? I mean, was this an opportunity for them perhaps to, to embed that longer term agenda, particularly given that the long term budgetary impacts of that, that package are already embedded in the budget? Uh, no, so I think they've done the right thing uh, in focusing on bringing forward the stage two cuts. I think they're much better designed for the task of economic stimulus. Um, they spread the cuts um, more to, to low and middle income earners who are more likely to, to spend them. Um, the, you know, the stage three cuts, um, the, the big concern I've always had with them, um, you know, and we can, we can talk about the fairness considerations and there's different ways you can look at that. But, um, you know, they, they say it's tax reform. Essentially, it's, it's pulling out a bracket. Um, it, it's not reform in a meaningful sense. And they do give away a lot of revenue. Um, I would have liked to see a real personal income tax reform package. Um, so one that looks at um, the huge number of offsets that exist and how we can come up with a more sensible structure. One that looks at tax concessions, rebates, um, all the complexities that feed in that mean that people that earn the same income but from different forms pay very different rates of tax uh, and package that in with tax cuts, with, with cuts to rates, uh, but try and broaden the base at the same time. And my big concern with the stage three is that essentially you're giving away the revenue but without the longer term reform. Um, 
So I think, you know, locking that in now would have meant, again, that opportunity was missed. Um, so I would still like to see uh, tax cuts in there in the future, but as part of a more comprehensive tax reform package, because taking out a bracket is not reform in my book. Uh, Stephen, you did a lot of work with Robert Carling in relation to tax cuts and tax structuring while you're at the CIS. Robert um, has expressed some concerns in the press release we've issued today about the likelihood that Stage 3 could now be or is perhaps more likely to be abandoned come 2024, given the likelihood for at least one election between now and then and the, the difficulties in, in selling uh, tax reform or tax cuts to higher income earners. Has the government missed its opportunity here whilst it's handing out $200 billion worth of benefits to, to various groups not to lock in the final stage of its, its tax cut agenda? I certainly would have supported the government doing that, uh, bringing the tax cuts uh, forward uh, in, in whole if possible. Um, I think it's worth recalling that really what the government is doing is just handing back bracket creep and in that sense I don't think this counts as reform. Uh, we have this sort of cyclical thing in Australian budget politics where we, uh, because we don't index our tax thresholds uh, uh, over time, you get an enormous amount of bracket creep and every few years or so, the government turns around and, and hands it back. Um, and this is not a, a tax reform. This is uh, just re easing what had been an increase in the real tax burden uh, while that bracket creep was allowed to take place. And it's interesting, of course, to note at this point in time, given our current inflation levels, indexing tax brackets would be cheaper now than it's ever been. Mm, yeah. So I think tax reform you know, remains uh, an unfinished uh, project. Uh, you'll recall the, the coalition government uh, in a previous term uh, made an effort to restart a tax reform uh, agenda. Uh, they didn't make much progress. Uh, I think it's something that they should come back to uh, as quickly as possible. Uh, obviously, corporate tax reform should be uh, a part of that effort as well. Um, the, what the government has announced today, of course, doesn't preclude uh, an effort on tax reform uh, that might be announced uh, perhaps in the run-up to the election and then implemented after the election. Uh, it's something the government could campaign on if they chose to do so. Um, but in terms of the immediate benefit that you would have uh, received uh, from bringing forward those tax cuts, the, the government has not done as much as it could have. Uh, Emma, what are your thoughts on the package that was actually passed? I, I'm fairly confident that you're opposed to the Stage 3 tax cut agenda, but do you think that Stage 2 and, and what's been brought forward is beneficial enough to have been one of the main elements of the government's budget last night? Um, yeah, so I'm relieved Stage 3 wasn't brought forward. Like Danielle, I think that would be locking in um, a fairly big hit to government revenue without the um, offsetting genuine reforms that are needed to to make that valid. Um, and I, I do see the, um, the elimination of that of that um, tier of the tax uh, system as effectively flattening our tax system and, and making our system much less progressive. I've long advocated for bringing forward a stage two, uh, way back before the last election, um, when the economy was pretty sluggish. I thought that um, tax cuts that were aimed at low and middle income earners were a good thing. As Stephen said, they do address, address um, bracket creep. I think they could have been slightly better targeted, but I'm not going to quibble with that at this point in time. Um, so no, I'm not upset to see stage two come forward. Um, and I think they could have been coupled with more support for those at the lower uh, lower end, but um, in, in and of themselves, I have no objection to that. But like Danielle, I don't see this as reform, and Stephen, I don't see this as reform. This is not the tax reform that we need long term um, and one of the big issues in Australia that we have is that we, we are overly reliant on income taxes and if you want to make arguments about the disincentive to, to work and to progress up the income ladder then that's a valid one um, because what we really need to do is look at how we tax wealth uh, in this country and we don't tax wealth effectively at all um, and by that I don't mean whacking a tax on the family home necessarily um, although I'm not you know I don't object to, to taxes on on well, the government did, in fact, introduce capital gains tax exemptions for granny flats, I think, as, as one of the sort of uh, 
odd measures that was sort of hanging out there in the budget, although I, I think, as my colleague Peter Tulip has pointed out, a lot more could have been done in the housing affordability space. A lot more could have been done in the housing affordability space. The number one thing would have been um, a massive investment in social and affordable housing to, to take pressure at the bottom end of the market. But look, I think taxing wealth and the way that we um, the way that we tax wealth creation and the way that we um, we actually subsidise the hoarding of wealth at the moment, certainly coming out of a recession and even going into it, has been a big problem. It's been a big drag on inflation. There's been a lot of money, a lot uh, you know, hoarded at the top of the income or the top of the wealth tree and not enough moving through the economy and I don't see much in this um, budget that will change that in fact you know I've seen a couple of comments from people vox popped about the tax cuts today and both of those I've seen so far I said oh this is great it will help me build back up my savings um, so we actually need that money in the economy moving through the economy uh, and so I think uh, thinking really thinking creatively about how we can uh, shift our reliance away from um, income tax a little and more on to wealth tax would be the reform that we need. Or consumption tax, although it's very difficult, I suppose, Danielle, to introduce a tax increase agenda um, in the current environment. Uh, I think, you know, given where the government's at at revenue, the fall in revenue that it's got now, uh, it, it's got to be very wary about announcing anything that looks like a tax increase on ordinary people, doesn't it? Uh, yeah, I actually think if you want to talk consumption tax in the current environment, you'd be talking about a reduction, a short term reduction in consumption taxes, um, more direct support really than, than personal income tax cuts, because it actually means that every dollar of revenue lost is a dollar consumed in the economy. Um, so yes, I don't think we're in a world where we're talking about tax increases, um, you know, the government needs to be looking at supporting the economy over the next few years. Uh, and quite frankly, that means um, budget deficits and, and racking up debt, which is exactly what was announced last night. Uh, I would, just the questions come through from Glenn that I'd be interested in terms of where the budget has at least made an attempt to support um, particular individuals, that is the wage subsidies that are being provided for younger workers, um, $200 a week I think it is for, for quite young workers and then for workers under the age of 35 it's, it's $100 a week. Uh, Glenn's question is whether or not that will displace um, older workers from the economy. I mean I know one of the things that, that, that a number of our institutes have pointed out in uh, recent years is the difficulty that older workers have in finding work. That being said, of course, recessions typically do have a fairly significant impact on younger workers. Emma, do you think these wage subsidies, the transition from the JobKeeper package to the young worker wage subsidy uh, will be a positive move? Is it likely to actually have the impact the government hopes it would or is it likely simply to either uh, pay companies to hire people as they would anyway or displace uh, older workers who, who will be left behind in the recovery? Um, well, the first thing to say is that a focus on young people's employment and economic participation coming out of a recession is a good thing. Um, so points for recognising that and for putting something in place. Like Danielle, I do agree that, you know, we can't keep JobKeeper in place forever. Um, it has to be withdrawn from the economy over time so that we are looking at, you know, ensuring we're supporting those businesses that have a viable future. But I do have some concerns about the targeting of these measures. Um, firstly, they're for people under 35, that's a good thing, but that could well mean the displacement of older workers. And we all know that um, if you lose a job in a recession over the age of 50, you're something like seven times less likely to get back into the workforce than if you're under 40. Um, the other concern I have with them is it's, you know, it's $200 a week for anyone up between 16 and 30, $100 between 30 and 35, and you only have to work 20 hours a week. So I think that the majority of them may well be taken up by uh, retail and hospitality businesses, hiring younger people on part-time contracts to do work that is fundamentally insecure and not going to lead really to long-term um, economic security and, and, the, and the, um, their ability to secure full-time permanent jobs with career paths. Um, so so it may be a short-term sugar hit, I think, for 
young people for the unemployment numbers amongst young people to get them back uh, to earning a bit of money that they can then spend back into the economy. But uh, over, lo over the long term, we know actually that um, over the last 15 years, the proportion of people on um, job seeker or on unemployment benefits for a longer period of time and now they're more likely to be over 45 than to be under 45 as they were 15, 20 years ago. Um, so I don't see anything in this budget that will address that problem. And that's particularly acute again for older women, particularly women between 45 and 54, and women between 55 and 65, um, who, are, who can then find themselves trapped on the unemployment benefit until they can access the age pension. So um, I am a little concerned that there's nothing targeted at that older workforce and that, as I said, um, the way that the subsidy is set up, it could just lead to a, a bigger boost of, of short-term um, insecure and casual work. Danielle, what, what's your sense of some of the intergenerational aspects of this? I mean, I think you know, the Grattan Institute's done probably more work th than anyone else in relation to some of these intergenerational issues. Um, we're looking at, you know, at a bare minimum, I think a fairly significant increase in, in expenditures around aged care coming out of the Royal Commission. Um, is it likely that, that you know, this is some measure at least towards balancing that intergenerational equation somewhat, or is, is this simply something that's designed to look like the government is doing something for young people? Look, it's hard to get a sense of whether it's going to be big enough. So, um, you know, I like the idea of the wage subsidy. Um, there is some, I should say, there is some protection built in around that older worker question in that it only applies for incremental hires. So, it relies on businesses, you know, actually boosting their total headcount and payroll. Um, so it's not like you're going to get an older worker sack to bring a younger one in. So that's good, uh, provided those protections work. It's stopping that sort of churn. Uh, it does mean, of course, that you may well favour hiring a younger worker <laughs> compared to an older worker when you're making that new hire. But I, you know, very much support actually um, targeting young people in this way. Um, you know, what we know from every downturn is that younger people fare worse in terms of their employment outcomes. This time that's magnified because they are disproportionately in those really hard hit um, sectors of hospitality and arts and retail. Um, and we know that the longer term economic consequences of extended unemployment for, for young people is really devastating. Um, and it was only sort of a few months into this pandemic that we were kind of getting the report card on what happened to young people post the GFC. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, Treasury put out work showing that that generation that um, graduated into the GFC labour market, which is you know, nowhere near as devastating as this labour market is for young people, um, we could still see the impacts on their employment rates and their career progression, their income progression, um, you know, a decade later. Um, and when we talk about low wages growth over the past 10 years, you know, it's mainly been low wages growth for young people. And, and most people that have looked at it in detail have attributed that to... Um, the labour market conditions coming out of the GFC. So young people do need a leg up. Um, and so I think this measure is well targeted. My, my only question is really, is it going to be big enough to actually boost those numbers seriously? Um, Stephen, it's interesting talking about low wages growth. I think one of the things that this budget has focused very heavily on is uh, trying to create a business friendly environment, trying to get business moving again, trying to generate jobs. Um, there's an instant asset write-off that's extended to businesses now with less than $5 billion in turnover. Uh, businesses will now have the opportunity to claim this year's losses against last year's profits, uh, giving them some, some help straight away. Uh, Anthony Carr is sort of talking in the comments about the, the need for a business-led recovery. Chris White, on the other hand, says that the asset write-off is actually just going to result in a timing shift for business investment and that, that you know, we'll, we'll end up presumably paying businesses who would have invested anyway to bring that investment somewhat forward. Um, do you see this sort of business-led recovery eventually translating to lower unemployment and then eventually through to wages, or are there other factors at play here that are, are going to retard that development? Well, even before the pandemic, we had a severe problem with business investment. So the business investment share of GDP uh, was pretty much at record lows. Uh, this is one of the reasons we've been running a current account surplus over the last uh, three quarters is there's been a, a collapse uh, in business investment 
So you overlay the pandemic uh, on top of that, and I think you have a real problem. So if we go back to why business investment might have been weak uh, prior to the pandemic, I think you can point to uh, a number of factors. Uh, so economic policy uncertainty, uh, both globally and domestically, I think was weighing on uh, business investment. A lot of that had to do with President Trump's uh, tariff war, uh, which affected investment uh, globally. Uh, I think it was uh, having an impact here as well. Uh, I think the corporate tax reform agenda still needs to be uh, prosecuted. So uh, corporate tax reform is certainly something that uh, could be used to uh, get business investment going uh, in the long term. And uh, I think one of the things business needs is uh, certainty in relation to uh, top line revenue flows. So uh, I think this is where monetary policy comes in. Uh, you need uh, stable expectations in relation to nominal GDP to underpin investment confidence. Uh, and so I think monetary policy was um, acting as a, as a break on business investment as well. Uh, and in many ways, this is the key to rebooting productivity. So we know that productivity growth uh, was actually negative in the run-up to the pandemic. Uh, there's been a pickup in GDP per hour worked uh, during the course of the pandemic, but this is really more a shift in the composition of the, uh, of the Australian economy. So those sectors that are highly productive, like mining, weren't particularly uh, affected by the pandemic, whereas some of the lower productivity uh, services sectors were you know, very severely affected. Uh, so that compositional shift has sort of artificially boosted the productivity numbers um, uh, in the most recent reporting of them. Uh, but we still have a, a productivity problem in Australia and it's very much related to the investment problem. We, we need new investment in order to embody new technology and innovation. Uh, so I think addressing the productivity problem very much comes down to uh, getting business investment started again. And the, the two big things I would do there is uh, getting the corporate tax reform agenda back on track uh, and trying to minimise the effect of economic policy uncertainty. Uh, and I think we'd strongly support those recommendations. I think one of the disappointing things, at least about uh, the government undertaking the investment allowance approach is that they have made it temporary rather than uh, having perhaps a smaller, uh, an initial benefit from that investment allowance, but making it more permanent so that there is that level of policy certainty going forward. Um, Emma, you've talked a lot about the need for government investment, particularly to make up the shortfall here on the private investment side. Um, I'm interested in your thoughts on that, but specifically as well, how do we then transfer from that high level of government investment to a higher level of private investment? What's, what's the transition mechanism that gets private investment back on track in, in your view? Well, I think this is this is the crux of the issue. Um, long term, we absolute and Stephen's absolutely right about this. We had a big problem with big business investment going into this recession, um, and I think the the problem here is that we've got this backwards. We're asking business to invest now. Um, rather than government to do the, the heavy lifting in the crisis with a view to moving to business investment when the economy is more stable. So my, my preference would be, and, it, and it, it builds on the sort of traditional approach to responding to big economic downturns, is for government to, in, to put what you might want to call seed funding um, or some investment into uh, getting businesses back up and running. And that, as we've talked about, could be the direct provision of, of um, income to people to spend in those small and medium businesses businesses that have been affected, but also a targeted use of government uh, policy, not necessarily direct cash inject injections, but government procurement policy, research and development tax concessions, and yes, some asset write-off, but, but as you say, perhaps smaller and spread over a longer period of time, to allow business to invest in future jobs, um, to, to invest in productivity enhancing technology, to take advantage of some of the opportunities in things like lithium mining and um, green steel, which is something the Grattan Institute's um, written very persuasively about, that can be the industries of the future that are going to employ people, not just for the next five years, but for the next 50 years. So government um, 
the government's role really here should be not just throwing cash at the business community, but getting the policy settings right. So getting an energy policy that we can that we know is going to be stable for more than 18 months would be a great start. And then over time, the, the business community does step up and say, okay, well, I know I'm going to make an investment there. I've got some certainty about the, the tax settings, um, the, the incentives that are going to be in place and the return on that investment for more than 18 months. And so I'm going to invest in those new... T- those new industries. What we've got here is an expectation that that business will rush to sort of take an asset right off um, and invest at a time when they have very low consumer demand and there's still a great deal of uncertainty around a lot of those industry policy settings that we've had now for a decade. So expecting um, the business sector to do that kind of um, injection of, of investment now when all of those other settings are missing, I think, is pretty optimistic and kind of ignores that the role for government should be created creating, uh, putting a floor onto the economy, lifting consumer demand and creating the kind of certainty in our tax and transfer system and in our um, investment incentives that allow business to pick up that heavy lifting over time. Uh, thanks for that. I'll just very quickly before we shift to our last question, we've just about reached the end of our hour. I know it's gone very quickly for me, hopefully it has for the viewers as well. One area, Danielle, where they have announced Um, a significant investment from the government is in infrastructure spending. Uh, You, your institute's written a fair bit about that. Do you see the likelihood that another ramp up in infrastructure spending will simply result in more waste and more of the government's money being spent on the wrong projects? Uh, Yes, I do. I do think that's a real risk. I think, you know, in terms of the stimulus measures in the budget, that was the least stimulatory. (laughs) Um, So, you know, it was the most substantial on the, the spending size of additional $10 billion in transport infrastructure. Um, not generally great stimulus because it's not particularly labour intensive. And when you look at the pipeline of major projects, uh, it's already incredibly significant. We were talking about hitting up against capacity constraints pre-COVID. Um, yes, some of those were slowed down because of um, the, the lockdowns and social distancing restrictions, but they're still there. Um, you know, they're still ready to ramp up again. And pumping money into a sector that's that's sort of close to capacity um, does not make a huge amount of sense. It's unlikely to create many new jobs uh, and and it certainly will put cost pressures on those projects. So um, to me, it was the kind of the the crazy part of the budget, if you like. You know, if you're going to do stimulus, and I think there should have been more of it, um, you know, putting it into transport infrastructure is not the right place for it. Uh, Thanks very much for that. And thank you, uh, everyone who's contributed to the questions today. I want to just wrap up by giving each of you the opportunity to basically just mention one big thing that you think wasn't uh, covered or wasn't covered properly in the budget. Um, Emma, what's the big thing missing from your perspective from last night's budget? Um, where to start? No, I think, look, I think the biggest disappointment... <laughs> Try and limit yourself just to one big thing one rather big than a whole suite, given will, our, our time constraints. I will, I will wrap it into one big thing, which is a, a real lack of agenda lens on this economic reconstruction and a recognition of the impact this recession's had on women's labour force participation. So the big thing missing for me was a big boost to early childhood education and care, um, because not only does that benefit women's labour force participation, but every dollar we invest in educating children under five provides a two dollar return over that child's lifetime it's the best thing we can do to give children the best opportunity as well so child care for me thanks emma danielle what's the big thing missing from your perspective i'm just going to back emma home here and agree on child care um you know it's absolutely important uh long-term reform we have really high out-of-pocket child care costs in this country and it is a massive drag on workforce participation. Um, The reason we have some of the highest rates of part-time work in the world for women uh, is because there is simply no financial incentive for them to work beyond three days a week. But even more important now in the pandemic, uh, we know parents have lost jobs and hours are pulling their children out of care. Uh, What that means is, you know, as labour markets start to pick up and and jobs become available again, uh, you are taking parents out of those potential pools for picking up that work and that's particularly going to hit women. Um, So, You know, they will be criticised for a very low-key budget and honestly, doing something on childcare would have been great for the economy, uh, great for women and also an important long-term reform.
Yeah, I've Thanks just put that. a link to Danielle's excellent report on childcare into the chat, so everyone should download. I'm glad that we got some plugs in. I'd have been disappointed <laughs> if we didn't. Although, Emma, I do see your book hiding yeah. there in the background. Yeah, Stephen, can you, can you give us your uh, what big thing was missing from the budget, please? The thing that was missing for me was the strategy and the resourcing of a strategy for reopening the borders. The hit to net overseas migration over the next few years is massive uh, and it's a big subtraction from the productive potential of the Australian economy. And I think there are legitimate questions we can ask the government about uh, what the plan is to get cross-border people flows uh, moving again, because uh, without them, uh, I think the Australian economy will be uh, under-realising its potential for many years to come. Fantastic. Look, thank you, Stephen, Emma and Danielle, for your excellent contributions today. Hopefully the viewers have gotten as much as I have out of that little uh, event that we've just run here in relation to the budget. Look, it's fantastic for us to have an opportunity um, to tap into some of the knowledge of, of other think tanks in Australia. Australia's got a fantastic think tank market and we do encourage you, obviously, to support the CIS, to, to join us, to become a member and support us, but also to check out the excellent work that their think tanks, the Grattan Institute, that Per Capita and the United States Study Centre are doing on a lot of these issues. Uh, thank you very much to our panellists and also uh, thank you for joining us today. Um, if there is anything else that you'd like to ask us, please don't hesitate to approach us on social media and remember to join the CIS for future excellent events. Thank you. Thanks, Simon. Thanks, Simon. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, everyone. Bye-bye. For decades, the CIS has been a fiercely independent voice working tirelessly to deliver evidence-based public policy. We rely solely on the generosity of people like you for donations to advance our classical liberal cause. To find out how you can get involved with the CIS, click on the links on screen now. And to be notified of future videos, make sure you subscribe and click on that notification bell. Mm -hmm.